we want to continue our conversation about this important fisheries management tool, place-based, space-based fisheries management tool, which is this notion of uh, protected areas, marine protected areas, and, and networks of these things. So where we left off last time, we were just, uh, just a little quick review. We were talking about, um, we discussed how big a reserve should be based on fish movement and various things. And the summary from that discussion was that um, for near shore areas, so coast, immediately coastal areas, um, generally speaking, you can get away with smaller reserves because we tend to have uh, much more diverse areas. And, and one smaller reserve can still encompass perhaps a bunch of different potential habitats for a bunch of potential different species. As we move more offshore and into more deeper water, areas become um, more homogeneous um, at, at the kind of scales that we're talking about here. And so um, the area that we tend to need uh, goes up. And then a, th a third idea that is still really only in the, in the theoretical stages, but technology is getting to the point now where we can actually realistically talk about this, which is this notion of um, temporary reserves as opposed to fixed in space all the time. This notion of um, something that would track with the things that fishermen are tracking, which the classic one would be a gyre, where you have a productivity front and the tuna or, or other fish are concentrating on that productivity front. Maybe we could, just like they're using satellite technology to find that uh, and track that in real time and deploy their nets and fishing efforts, maybe we could similarly do something like, I don't know, 10% of all gyres are off, off limits to fishing or something like that. Um, so very much uh, on the on the fringes of thought, but it's becoming more and more into the realm of possibility every day. Okay, next question we want to talk to, uh, speak to, is this notion of, uh, are we getting more production outside of the particular boundaries? So we still don't have a huge amount of, of data on this to be helpful, but this is an experiment I did um, in graduate school, and this was an experiment about my algae and what I did is I, I, I made this big giant tarp which almost killed people and there's a whole bunch of stories about that um, so I floated that that tarp um, essentially over the bottom of the this cove out at Catalina Island and what do you guys see so so the kelp bass is on the left that's the number one um, fished recreational fish in Southern California um, super popular fish very abundant fish everybody, everybody gets kelp bass the fishermen call them calico bass, but they're really kelp bass. Um, so uh, on the picture on the right is my experiment. Do you, do you see any pattern with the fish there? They're hanging out in there. They're hanging out in there, right. And they hung out in there very specifically. They didn't go outside. They didn't go out into the light. They, they hung out in there. So, for example, if this was our marine protected area, we're doing a great job at making fish, right? Maybe, I'm a tr maybe we're attracting fish in. Clearly, um, I put this experiment up, and within a day, this is where the fish were. Probably within a few hours, this is where the fish were. So clearly, I didn't have a baby be born and grow to you know, several inches in size over the course of a couple hours. So I've attracted fish with this. So fish have decided I could go to place A or place B, and I'm going to place A. So clearly that happens. We know that happens. Everyone agrees with that. The question is, at what point do fish become, let's say, so abundant underneath my, my tarp that they actually start going out into the, the outside area, the, the unprotected area? Cool? So is that tarp acting like a fish aggregating device? Uh, you, could, you could call it a fish aggregating device, sure. So a fish aggregating device is anything in the water that provides structure, particularly in a pelagic habitat. So you can imagine if, if you're not used to having hard walls and there's a hard wall there, hey, on that hard wall, it could be a log, it could be a fallen off cargo container off a ship, it could be whatever. Now there's a surface that maybe some algae, some macroalgae can grow on. And then that macroalgae, there's some invertebrates that can grow on there. And then all of a sudden you start having these little communities grow up and then fish attract to it. And so the term fish aggregating device, or FAD, F-A-D, is usually what people use. In this case, um, I don't think that's actually what's happening here. Uh, what's actually going on here, I think, um, 
I, I can't I can't disprove it. So in theory, it could be a, a, a fad, but I had some controls and other things. It actually appears to be the amount of light that they're queuing off of. And so it has to do with the shape of their eyeball. And, and, and different size fish see in different amounts of light. They're, they don't have an eyeball like you and I have that have an iris that can. You see this drilled into the sand, and there's a buoyant line. And it goes up here, and then there's a, um, a knot. And then above this, there's a float. So those things are always rigid and taut and, and trying to float to the surface. And they're the same distance off the ground. OK. Um, Love to talk about my experiments longer, if you guys want to, but let's keep going. Um, so uh, again, the question is, do marine protected areas increase yield? And so uh, let's talk about some examples, historical data here. Uh, on the left, it's algae. So this is from down in South America, or uh, uh, Southern Hemisphere, excuse me, New Zealand. So they're, they're laminariales, so the same family as our kelps, but they're not the same kind of kelps we have. They're, they're more shorter statured kelps, but nevertheless, that and then another brown. And what we see is, uh, on the left is when the marine protected area went into effect. And then as we go to the right, it's, it's, it, it's aging, right? And what we see here is in some cases, let's take the blue kelp line. In some cases, we start the marine protected area and there's this immediate growth. Growth is just sort of consistent, more or less linear growth. Growth, 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 growth. In this case, it's being expressed as the number of individuals per unit area. But there's more and more and more and more, more guys, and it's just pretty much constant from day one. If we look at the pink line, what we see there is, yeah, that's happening too, but it's much more subtle, right? So it's taking a long time, long time, long time, decades maybe even. And then at the end, boom, then we get this big, production, this big abundance where we start to see it leaking out and, and, and shedding propagules and babies outside. So we have this pattern of some species can respond really quickly and really rapidly. Others need a period of, of uh, acclimation or recovery or whatever the, the process is going on there. And then we're seeing a similar thing in African fish on the right uh, image where um, again, it's, the, it's starting off on the left. <coughs> Excuse me, starting off on the left, when we started the closure, we started the, the exclusion of fishing. And then uh, over time, as we're going into the different decades. Again, in the case of the surgeon fish, the blue line, it's more or less pretty, pretty consistent, right? Whereas the paired fish, initially not much happens, and there's a quick period of whoop. And in this case, there's a plateauing. So it's not as if we produce, produce critters that could leak outside all the time, always better and better. We're, we're, in this case, probably hitting the carrying capacity for that chunk of reef. And they can produce X number of fish, but not any more than that. Once they reach that carrying capacity, will they migrate outside of that area so they can keep doing what fish do? Uh, they could. They could. But, but the rate at which we're going to do that, so, but this is showing that it's hol holding stable. So in theory, they could, yeah, but, but, but in this particular case, they're not. Producing and just, there's no more living in that area because they're migrating out. Right, so, the, so that's, right. So let's look at this. So this is Georgia's Bank. This is where we closed fishing due to cod, uh, because of the cod uh, fishery collapse. Uh, now, I have not rendered the videos, all the videos yet from Hawaii. So a lot of the, so we, I've been putting up stuff. There's more going up. You guys should be watching that. Those are mostly summary, quick, short blurb videos. I also, I also have the full on recording. Most of the things guys were saying, it just will take me a while to get them, get them uh, uploaded and edited and stuff. But um, one of the things we talked about there was a vessel management system. So this is George's Bank. Anybody, has anybody watched The Deadliest Catch or, any, or not, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So these fishermen go out, it's really crazy. There's also the Wicked Tuna, there's all these, all these other shows. This is waters off of Massachusetts and, and New England can be crazy, can be really intense, dangerous water, right? So it's not just the guys are going out trying to make, catch fish, they're also going out trying to stay alive. So in this case, one of the things that most of the operators have installed is essentially a GPS beacon that's on this ship and it's constantly tracking where the ship is. 
And uh, it's automatically reporting that through satellite or radio. There's different ways to do it, but basically reporting it back to the mainland, saying boat X is at position latitude and longitude at this time. And it depends on the ship and whatever, how frequently it updates it, but it, it's fairly frequent. So it turns out you can use that data. So that, and that's important data because if they have a problem, if, they're, if a storm comes in, if their ship, if, they're, if, they're, if their motor breaks or something like that, right? Th there's there's um, uh, a strong incentive for the fishermen to have this system working and working properly, right? Because if there's a problem, it's going to help save their butt potentially. As a as a side benefit, though, we can actually start to look at how vessels are moving around, right? And so what we're looking at here is these. So these guys are trawlers. So these guys are, are towing, towing um, uh, fishing gear behind them. So towing fishing gear, ha and that has to go at a certain speed, OK? And so what we're showing here is just the, just the vessels that are moving at the speed where the fishing gear is effective. So they're not traversing. They're not just going right, left, or going home, or going out. This is where they're actively fishing. And what you see, and then this is just a heat map then of their locations. And so the, the um, hotter the colors, the more reports of positions uh, at, the, at this trawling speed uh, are being hit. And the lighter colored, cooler colors, fewer things. And so what do you see? What pattern do you see here? They're fishing at the edge of the room. Right. They're all along the edge. So now you, maybe that's because, say, underneath this leftmost uh, rectangular one, maybe it's just the best spot around, right? There, there's, what's probably going on there is there's a bank. There's, there's a ridge. There's, there's topographic relief that the fish are queuing off of. And that's why the fishermen were going there. And therefore, that's why we've put the closure in place there, right, to give these fish a chance to recover. Uh, but check it out. You're right. They're fishing all around the edge. They're what's, all, what's known as fishing the line, fishing the map edge of that restricted area. So if, if there was never any leakage outside of these things, these guys wouldn't do that because it wouldn't be cost effective to spend time there, right? Clearly, there's some amount of benefit to being next to one of these reserves than, than some random spot in, in the ocean, right? So even though the fishermen sometimes say, we want to see evidence of this, if you look at how they behave, they behave as if there really are a lot of fish or potential fish leaking out of these systems. So, so spill over out of this, the area. Cool? Pretty good? All right. So again, fisher, fishery, <coughs> fish yields um, will change, but we pretty much see pretty clear evidence that when we do put a, a marine protected area in, the yields go up inside the reserve. Um, there is this question as to how much is attraction, like I showed you when I put up my, my uh, light, my, my, my shade plots. How much is attraction versus production? We'd really like to see production. So of course attraction is going to happen initially, but we really ultimately want to see more babies being born in there that can then leak out. Um, we don't have as much evidence of the spillover effect, but over the years we're getting more and more evidence and, and uh, there's lots of um, uh, yes, so we're getting more and more evidence over time that spillover actually um, works or is happening. We'll talk about some examples in a second, but uh, one thing that's a, that's a management question, not so much a science question, but more of a management question, which is, hey, we have some, exist we have some existing marine protected areas that we created because it's the Cape Canaveral or it's a national park or it's a something. Can we use that ex those existing closed or restricted uh, activity areas in um, in, a, in a more robust network. And so this is a paper that these guys uh, wrote about a decade ago that asked the question, um, in the specific case of Australia, 
hey, can we, can we use this? And so they said, what if we did two things? What if we just totally ignored the existing, our existing networks? Because again, just like our national parks and other things, the existing networks were created for a whole variety of reasons, usually aesthetic, right? They weren't necessarily picked to, to represent all the biodiversity or all the you know, types of ecological functioning goals that you and I might now want to have as the, as the motivator. Instead, they just kind of were there for political reasons or whatever. So the question is, can we, can we uh, uh, ignore that and get a good answer? Can we include those and get a good answer in terms of a new network that we um, uh, uh, make? And what they found is that um, the most efficient system didn't use the existing things. So purely speaking, just on the ecological goings on, we should delete everything and start over from scratch. Pretend like we didn't have any of these marine reserves or, or MPAs to begin with. Um, and if you used, if you used um, some of those existing reserves, you're going to have opportunity costs, right? Because you're going to be, because we are, are in the management world, this isn't a modeling exercise, right? In the management world, we only have so many dollars. We only have so many guys that can patrol and ladies that can patrol the, the water, right? We can't have every single square meter. So if we're going to leave some in place because they're there by traditional happenstance, that's going to be less that we can put in the quote unquote ideal place. Okay, now let's start looking at some examples of these things. Cool? Any questions about that stuff so far? Okay, let's start with uh, an example that I know well where I did my PhD. So this is out on Catalina. This is one of the smallest um, marine protected areas we have. <coughs> when it was created, it was called the Catalina Marine Life Reserve. And it had a quasi-status from 1965 to 1988. So, we're, so I'm showing you a picture of, this is the, near the Two Harbors region. This right here is, this is the town of Two Harbors. So, so this picture is taken from this perspective. So the Two Harbors is right here. So here's Two Harbors. This is the, there's a thing called Big Fisherman's Cove here. And then this is the, this is the uh, marine lab the university owns all this land, and this is the marine lab. So essentially we're talking, check out the picture, just the water really, really tight into the coast. Happenstance for this particular place means that you could walk up to the water tower here. You could walk up to, let's see, where am I? You can walk up to this ridge, and you can look down. So the, on the other side, which you can't see, are all the lab buildings, the dorms, and everything. So a five-minute walk, you can be on top of the ridge. And you can be sitting there and you can watch if people are, are coming in and anchoring where they're not supposed to be anchoring, fishing where they're not supposed to be fishing, that kind of stuff, right? Super, super easily. It also happens that um, for a lot of this time, I don't, I don't know if she works there anymore, but, but one of the ladies that worked in the front office, one of the secretaries, her husband was the head of the Harbor Patrol. So the head Marine Sheriff, if you will. And so he lit, his boat was right here. So we had have very easy access, very small area, going from geographic landmark to geographic landmark. So very easy to see if you're in or out. Uh, and and a very easy to observe and very high potential to enforce. And this and from from uh, let's see, from here to here at high speed, you can get there in, you know, four minutes if you have to or something, right? So really, really quick response time. So a bunch of unique factors there led to this um, uh, unique reserve. And then it was formally considered a marine protected area in 1988. But it has a long history of this, this uh, status. So, th so that, that's one example. It's a small example from California. And remember we said before that the majority of our reserves across the world are small. 
We have some of these big, giant, huge ones in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and stuff, but those are, numerically, those are the exception. Most of them are very small, a, a few mile, a mile or so by a mile or something on that kind of scale. Okay, so let's talk about marine protected areas in small Pacific uh, island states. So the first one we'll talk about is this so-called natural park of the Coral Sea. The French name is there. I'll, I'll, I don't, I'm, I don't, I never took French, but it, Le Parc Naturel de la Mer de Coral. How's that? Okay, that's probably totally wrong. So this is in New, uh, New Caledonia, which is where this background picture is taken. And uh, it's, it's, you know, far from um, Australia, which is the closest big, big uh, landmass to it. It's been French since, uh, you know, for about 150 years. It got autonomy right around the millennium, as many of these small Pacific Island nations started down this path in post-World War II. These guys just take a, took a lot longer to, uh, to get there. Um, um, so it's still French territory, but it has a high degree of autonomy. So it's not completely independent, but it, 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 uh, they don't necessarily want to be completely independent because they get benefits from the French government. Um, so it's about a quarter of a million people or so. Um, the economy is actually larger than New Zealand's, which is pretty crazy. That's because of fishing and stuff. And so what happened is, we, as we've seen a lot in recent years in the Pacific, we have this mix of local intention or local interest in, in doing something about marine protected areas and uh, some capacity coming from the outside in the form typically of international NGOs, groups like Conservation International, Nature Conservancy, folks like that. So these guys came together. And in 2012, they got together at the Pacific Islands Forum and they said, hey, we want, we in New Caledonia, we want to have this, uh, this marine protected area. We want it to be big and we want it to be a tourist, tourist attraction thing. We want to protect our reefs so people would come visit us and give us their tourist dollars, that kind of stuff. So in uh, 2014, they formally enacted the legislation and they, and they designated this area that's about um, 1.3 million square kilometers. Um, and that this single designation knocked France from, uh, from France's territorial waters around the world from 4% being in protected status to 16%. So huge bump, huge, like, wow, everything's great. That's great. Awesome. The problem is, uh, is this, it, it, there's a bit of, a, a, well, a bit or a lot of the cart before the horse. There's a lot of, hey, let's pass a law. Let's say this and, hey, cool, good, boom, yeah, great. So this notion of milk for free, all that stuff. So there, the extent of this marine protected area is from the coast of the island all the way out to the exclusive economic zone, which goes 200 nautical miles, right, out from the shoreline. They hate, the details haven't been determined yet. Maybe next year, which is what the target is, if they hit their target, They'll tell us what their MPA does. Recall, we've said that marine protected areas, we typically have been talking about no-take, meaning you can't fish there, but there's a, whole, there's a whole spectrum of potential designations. Maybe you don't have commercial activities, maybe you don't have recreational activities, what have you. And so people can do whatever designation they want. In this case, there's been no, no determination as to what that's going to be. This is a so-called sister site to some of the areas where we work in the Cook Islands. And um, really, it's, it's something of a Hail Mary pass, I would say, which is um, fishery, they're seeing reduced profits from their fishery. And because of depressed tuna populations and things like that. And so the thought is, hey, we'll put this in and we'll get a lot of tourists that are going to come in. So here is the poster child of what we hope does not happen, but unfortunately seems to be becoming more of the poster child. So this is the Phoenix Island, Island protected area. Everybody calls this Pippa. And this is in, in the Republic of, which you might look at this country and say uh, Kiribati. You actually pronounce it Kiribati. Um, and there's some great work uh, going on there and similar areas by some of our friends up at Santa Barbara City College. Uh, so in this case, 
these guys said, hey, we're going to establish this Phoenix Island protected area in 2008. And it was officially recognized as, as United Nations um, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2010. It's big. It's about, um, it's about one third the size of that one which I just showed you. Um, and it's about 11% of the total exclusive economic zone of the Kiribati. It's, uh, we'll hear more about Big Ocean in a minute, but it's, it was one of the big first jewels of this, this international consortium called Big Ocean, which is trying to promote these large scale marine protected areas. This was created as a collaboration between the New England Aquarium, Conservation International, and the, the local government in the Kiribati. It became this huge thing. It became, everybody talked about it, all kinds of press. It's what supposedly what we want in the Phoenix Island, just in case you didn't know, here's the Cook Islands where we work, here's uh, Phoenix Island, here's Hawaii where we just were. So it's, it's uh, here in the Pacific, near the equator. So this became a bully pulpit to start talking about the value of, of MPAs, why overfishing is bad, all this stuff. All kinds of discussion that then bleed into talking about all kinds of problems that are real problems. Stressed reefs, coral bleaching, overfishing, da 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 da, da. This also became celebrated as, an, as evidence that we could use marine protected areas in the developing world. Primarily, most of those examples I've shown you so far are in the America, in North America and Europe, places like that where we have a relatively robust government, relatively robust economy, and can afford to do policing and stuff like that. A lot of people have, have said this won't work in other parts of the world. So this was touted as, hey, yep, we can do it anywhere. Like these guys are doing it. Um, this was also touted by President Tong the, the, the head of the government there as a quote significant contribution to the world community in the hope they would also act. So this is the uh, one of the, the classic places where you'll see if you, if you google anything about sea level rise, Pacific Islands, these are the folks that are saying they're gonna have 94,000 environmental refugees because of climate change, climate change refugees, rising sea levels or islands are disappearing. And these folks are going to lose their home in a few decades. So this is this marine protected area is saying, look, man, we took a hit. We took a hit ourselves. We restricted the activities that we could do. So therefore, you guys should step up to bat. You guys, the developed world, have mostly caused climate change, are, are pumping all the CO2 in the atmosphere and this and that, causing the drivers of sea level rise. So you should pay us to help us relocate. This guy was, was feted as an, a conservation hero, environmental hero, got all these awards from all these North American envir en environmental NGOs, etc. He was a huge fundraiser around the world. Um, unfortunately, it was all BS. So the PIPA is in fact what we would now refer to as refer to as a paper park, meaning it is a it is a protected area on paper only. There is no on the ground actual conservation. So when someone like you or me goes and Googles a national a global database and gets a number on there, we put that number down. That number doesn't necessarily mean anything. So the term paper park first emerged when people said, oh, we have this park to protect tigers and things like that. And then we find out people are shooting tigers inside the park, right? So, um, yeah, so there's all, there's all kinds of stuff you guys can read on this, but the short version is that they passed no legislation. And indeed, after, after all this stuff has been going on, these guys sold new tuna fishing rights inside this marine protected area. So there's very little evidence that any, the, the management hasn't changed at all. People are still doing all the previous practices they had. So the question becomes, what does marine protected area mean if no one changes their behavior or no one changes their management efforts? Somebody had a question. Corey, do you have a question? Uh, you kind of answered it because I was wondering like, how is it a total sham? You said they never passed legislation. Yeah, they, continue to they just sort of said they did, basically. Yeah. So, 
is this start, there's fears that this is starting to spread, this notion. Because, hey, these guys got all these environmental awards, all this international attention, all this great stuff, and they didn't do anything. They didn't have to do any heavy lifting. So this is from, uh, what is this? This is from three years ago. I think our trip three years ago in the Cooks. And this is uh, Dr. Steele and uh, the other doctors, Dr. St our Dr. Steele and Dr. Steele from Northridge. And then Dr. Lambrinos from Oregon State. And we're looking at the proposed plan for um, the Cook Islands, uh, essentially marine protected area that they, that they call their marine park. So the Cook Islands, uh, are 15 widely dispersed islands across the South Pacific. Very small area. Each of the islands is very small. However, it has um, the one of the largest exclusive economic zones in the world. So almost 2 million square kilometers of the ocean they control is their territorial water. Very strong cultural traditions and values are still alive there. Very much so in the last decade or two, a tourism-centric economy so they really need healthy reefs. They really need good places to fish if they want to bring in uh, travelers from uh, across. Um, and uh, yeah. And so they announced this in 20, 2012 that, hey, we're, we are creating the Cook Islands Marine Park. Uh, this, was, this was a collaboration between what used to be their environmental ministry, what you, we might consider the EPA, However, they had a huge problem in the late 90s and they basically dissolved much of that, much of the, they laid off a bunch of government workers. And a lot of those folks just left and formed an NGO that now works closely with the government, but it's not technically the government. And that's this TIS, the, the acronym we use is TIS. Um, and they collaborate with Oceans 5, which is a, a collaboration of Conservation International, the Pew, a bunch of, bunch of US-based uh, international NGO, uh, conservation NGOs, and they started drafting plans. And so that's where we are. So th this is all of the, the territorial waters of the Cook Islands. They're talking about just the southern islands is where the park would be. They're still in the midst of, of talking with folks and meeting with folks. So last year when we were there, um, they were, we're still working on some of their outreach and speaking with traveling to all the different islands and, and getting stakeholder uh, input. Uh, so don't know. The most recent discussion is the marine protected area would start 50 miles offshore. So this would be a pelagic um, effort. Important to note that this would affect both fishing, also potentially mineral extraction. That's what this map here is showing. These are manganese nodule hotspots. And so there's great interest in perhaps seabed mining in the Cooks. So this marine protected area would, would influence not just fishing potentially, but also mineral extraction. And so again, it's, it's, it's a question of, you know, we're congratulating ourselves, but is it really a marine protected area if we announce it, but we don't have any rules yet? Of course, we should, we should engage the public. Of course, we should have stakeholder engagement. Of course, we should get buy-in and make sure everybody's good with this. But maybe you shouldn't officially announce the park exists, right? Maybe you should wait until the end of that process. So the fear is that more and more countries are following the, the Phoenix Island, the, 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 the PIPA um, model of getting all, the, getting all your cake right now and not doing the hard work. Not that I want to, I don't want to give the impression that, that all these other folks are doing messed up stuff and we aren't. So let's look at Florida, the epicenter of so many great things in our wonderful country. I want to tell you guys about some reefs there. These are Oculina, these are coral reefs, Oculina varicosa, the so called ivory tree coral. The area we're talking about is off the eastern seaboard of the, the main part of Florida, where our recent hurricane just came through. Or, or, came close to making landfall. Um, these are branching stony coral, thin. More, more, if you look at them, you, you think the more delicate type of uh, uh, architecture. A given head can easily be over a century old. Interesting for us, though, they're not shallow coral. They're deep water coral. 
So they don't have zooxanthellae associated with them. So they're not photosynthesizing to meet their energy budgets. All of their energy budgets are being met by the coral capturing plankton, filter feeding plankton, and, and capturing that guy from the water column. These guys are on for Florida. Again, it's Florida, so things are very different there. Their high relief reefs are 10 to 30 meter reefs, right? That would be a small reef for us. But for there, that's a huge reef. So that's where these guys are growing. On these rock outcrops, relatively, relatively small rock outcrops off the, the soft bottom in deep water, uh, relatively deep water off the Florida coast. Um, they're primarily concentrated in this 170 kilometer area between Fort Pierce at, at, on the south and Daytona Beach in the north. And again, they're, they're occurring mostly pretty deep, right? On the order of 200, 300 feet deep in, in, the, uh, in the ocean. Now that we've been studying them and done coring, we know that these reefs have existed in this area for at least 15,000 years. So these are long persisting entities. Um, uh, the coral heads are, are turns out are really valuable for invertebrate and for for fish habitat and everything in particular. These these three species, these gr two grouper and this porgy, are really important in the um, tar fishery uh, species that really like to hang out in these areas. This is what that coral looks like. This is a piece uh, um, to give you a sense of scale. Um, th on the right are some diagrams from the late 1800s. So again, these were known for a long time, but we didn't necessarily know where they lived. We'd, we'd find them washed up on the beach at times after big storms sometimes. And this is what we typically see now. So here's a broken piece of that coral head. And if you look closely, what's all wrapped around there is fishing line. So it's been snapped by someone's fishing line wrapped around. They were snagged, they tried to pull it, and it, and it broke. Uh, don't worry about writing down all these number, dates, just look at it for a second. So this is the management history. So a lot of fishing was going on there in the 60s, post-World War II, 60s, 70s. Finally, Harbor Branch, one of our research, uh, oceanic research in institutes in, in uh, Florida, um, figured out that these guys were there and they, and they um, uh, started tracking them and looking at them. And uh, this one researcher in particular after doing those surveys, petitions the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Regional Fisheries Management Council, which we haven't talked about yet, but we have these, these, this network of fishery management councils around the U.S., uh, petitions them to say, hey, we should protect these beds. 1980, okay? Star Wars was still new, right? This is a long time ago. Disco was still on some people's radio. There were still eight tracks in people's El Caminos at the time. Um, uh, and so four years later, the federal regulators say, okay, we're going to create this, this small area, right? A couple hundred square kilometers that we're going to designate as a habitat area of particular concern. I don't know what the hell that means, but it means some form of protection, right? It means you can't just go fish there willy nilly, can't drop anchors there anymore. Uh, they go down several years later, early 90s, and find still nothing's coming back. It still looks like it's all nuked. So we expand it into a no-take. Not only can you not do certain fishing practices, not only can you not anchor, now you can't do anything. Can't fish there, can't anchor there, no take whatsoever. 1994, so this is 14 years after we make the first formal petition. Um, and still nothing's coming back, so we start some experiments to see if we can get the baby coral to start to you know, land and, and, uh, and start to metamorphose and do all that kind of good stuff. Um, and it just goes on and on and on. We keep expanding it and expanding it and expanding it. Nothing seems to work. So here's the current area in red, and we're still finding all of this stuff is broken coral, dead coral. This is what, uh, some, these are some old pictures now, but this is some, this is what these areas look like before. So they're not like our high relief California reefs, but nevertheless, they are dramatic reliefs for the sandy bottom region where they're, they're occurring. And so what we see is, what do we see? Tons of coral, lots of fish, 
all kinds of invertebrates in the nooks and crannies in there, right? So they can hide from the fish. Fish can hide from their bigger predators. Awesome. Very diverse. This is what it looks like now. Areas that have been trawled, areas that have been heavily fished. It's basically all dead. And instead of seeing erect coral and attached to the bottom, you're seeing just shards and fragments of coral rubble. So it turns out the problem is, um, and there was a video I was going to show, but because of time I'm not, I'll, 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 I'll put it up on our, I'll link to it on our um, YouTube channel. But basically it's just a quick four minute video that kind of shows you the comparison. But what's going on here now is that all this stuff tumbles. The current comes, that piece of coral flips. So if you're a little baby coral and you land and you become a little baby coral polyp and you start growing, before you can get to big robust size, there's going to be a storm come through or a whatever come through and you're going to get flipped and jammed and shoved your face into the sediment and you're going to basically starve, right? So the area is so disturbed, it's beyond the point of naturally recovering on any kind of realistic time scale, right? We've so tweaked the system that simply saying, no more fishing, that's not going to do it. And that was the video I was going to show you. So uh, the point here is that trawling and, and fishing can be quite detrimental. And in many cases, trawling, uh, when done over structures like coral or seagrass, is akin to clear-cutting forests, literally exactly what it is. For trawling over soft bottoms, not necessarily. But, but what you're seeing right here, for example, it are trawl tracks that were made decades ago that you can still see. So, so these, these are, and, and so again, trawl, if you guys don't know, I haven't talked about some of the fishing methods. Trawl basically means here's the boat, we're dragging something behind. Typically trawls will have nets. So in this case, they have these uh, otter, otter panels here, the, these paddles that act to keep the net open. And we're dragging a net that has a float on the top and has a weighted line, typically lead lined uh, on the bottom that, that keeps it down the bottom and it goes and it essentially catches everything that um, it uh, can't swim as fast. So the, so the fish will start to swim away from the net and they swim for a while and they eventually get tired and they, boom, they get sucked in the net. So pretty much a, a trawl is a big grab of whatever it can, whatever it can get. Here's some looks at restoration. Actually last year, uh, the, the Blue Ocean Economy uh, conference that we went to, we actually met some of these reef ball guys. The, some of them are based in Santa Barbara, but they didn't seem to be too interested in talking to us for reasons that I don't fully understand. But in any event, so, so these guys try these different experiments and the short version is nothing has really worked. But this was a, a great idea and in other places this does seem to be working, which are these so-called reef balls. So these guys have come and they've poured concrete and they have a whole protocol for making this. You don't need anything special. All you need are some balloons and some very simple materials that just about any tropical island would have. And they essentially pour a concrete mold with a bunch of beach balls. And those beach balls create these holes. And then after the concrete is cemented in, they pop the balls. And then you have these holes. So it's jump-starting habitat for these fish. So even though the coral haven't recruited yet, there's now structure the fish can cue in on. And we now have all this hard substrate that the coral can recruit on. And it isn't going to tumble and, and go away. So in, in some places, this is working really well. Here, uh, it, it seems to be so far tweaked, we, we don't see, um, still see very poor recruitment. Okay, that's one example. Another example, Pacific Northwest, I'm going kind of fast. You guys have questions about that? I've, but, I've yeah. heard much about um, using rebar to do this also. I read something about people were like erecting rebar structures and then putting like a very mi minute electric charge to it to attract minerals in the water. I've heard about that. I've heard about that. Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of evidence that it's working really well. Other ones that are working quite well, I think, are, are uh, sort, of, sort of similar to that, but um, where we, we, pr we bake clay model coral reefs and, and uh, coral heads, make them like snowflake patterns, like, like star patterns, and you bake them, and then you have all this, this ceramic, and you can put them in a, a conics box, you can put them in a, 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 a cargo, bo cargo box, so they stack flat and then ship them to wherever. And you take them and you assemble them just like a paper mache model or a, a cardboard model. And so they make three, then they become three dimensional and they, use, and they anchor those with rebar in. 
So the same idea, trying to provide some initial structure where a coral might have been damaged by an anchor or something like that, a place for these, and, and they're made out of calcium carbonate, so it's the same material as the coral is made out of. So I have heard of that. Those seem to be working um, well. Um, okay, so real quickly, Pacific Northwest estuaries. Example I'll tell you about is South Slough, which is up in Coos Bay, Oregon. And the story here is all about salmon and the historic salmon runs, all that kind of good stuff. By the 1970s, more than 80% of that, that phone call I was on earlier is our science advisory panel where we're trying to restore Ormond Beach. Um, these guys have lost 70% of their wetland um, extent. And so in, in this case, really cool, the citizens got together, not, not scientists, not, not a government agency. They said, this is messed up, man. Salmon's important for our culture. So we want more salmon. So clearly we need to have more estuaries because that's where salmon you know, grow up and spend some of their time. And so if we have screwed up estuaries, we're gonna have screwed up salmon. So we wanna do something about that. So they start to lobby the government. And uh, again, something we haven't talked about yet, but Coastal Zone Management Act uh, is, is, a, is a federal piece of legislation. And essentially, we, they create this 19 square kilometer, so small, reserve, um, 2.4 kilometers, square kilometers of which is uh, mud flat and habitat for the salmon. This is where we look like, this is where we're talking about here on this part of Oregon, so the southern part of Oregon. This is, the, this is the estuary watershed. This is what it looks like, classic Pacific Northwest, all kinds of great water, uh, you know, beautiful hardwoods, etc. <clears throat> and so this is what they do. So, um, so they knew that before 1900s they had salt marsh in this area. Then they diked it, which is essentially a dam, a, a dam on the side of a uh, water structure, and drained it so they could do agriculture and they could have cattle grazing there. They start this restoration. Oh, sorry. And so by the, 19, by the 1980s, when these, these citizens were getting worried in the early 70s, by the 1980s, the salmon runs were, were vastly reduced. And by the 1990s, uh, the coho was, com one species of salmon was completely extirpated. And so mid 90s, they start this restoration project. So, okay, let's see. So we, we got the reserve, we restrict people's activities, but again, it wasn't enough. Just doing the, just doing the saying stop doing the bad thing wasn't enough. We have to do some good. And so that's what they did. So they designed this Coons Marsh, which was a, it's a, a phased restoration. And this is what they basically did. So they had this diked land. And the idea was they would go in and they would change the hydrology. So these guys went in. So this area here was diked historically, right? So this is wrong, wrong elevation. So they came in and they created different cells and tried to have the water flush differently. And they came in and they excavated tidal channels because it turns out if we just let nature do its own course, eventually these channels will develop, but it might take a long time. So these guys jump-started it by going out and digging. So this is an example of one where they didn't really do much. Here's one in the second phase where they've come in and they've dug a main channel, side channel, side channel. And, and these are the places where the baby salmon come in and feed on the spiders, where they come in and feed on the insects, and they, and they get this great resource. Just simply having a wetland doesn't necessarily do it for them. They need the right type of habitat for their particular life history stage. And so it turns out, so that seems to be working really well. They have a lot of salmon now. So again, we in the U.S. can screw stuff up too, um, and just simply pulling off the extraction pressure isn't necessarily enough. Let's talk about some other Pacific reefs. Here's the Philippines. Philippines, huge island nation. Tons and tons of islands. More than 7,000 islands make up the country of the Philippines. So lots of coastline. 20,000 kilometers, linear kilometers of the coastline. Also, two-thirds of the population live in the immediate coastal zone. So a lot of people are there interacting. A lot of problem with, with high poverty, etc super high marine biodiversity. It's near the so-called coral triangle in the Pacific where we have the greatest diversity of snails and fish and coral and all that kind of good stuff. They have more than 500 marine protected areas in there across their uh, uh, island chain. Importantly, they have a long history of traditional management. We haven't talked about traditional management yet. We've talked about all this modern, modern approach. 
1940, they created their first national park. And um, since then, they've created many, 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 many um, smaller scale governmental jurisdictional parks, protected areas. Lots of bad practices have gone on there traditionally, primarily motivated by um, the extreme poverty that, that has historically plagued some of these regions. So on the, on the left, you're seeing this guy dynamite fishing, the worst possible way to fish. You literally take an explosive, throw it in the water, it explodes, and the concussion wave kills just about everything that's around it. So fish have swim bladder. Many fish that we're talking about have swim bladders. So they have, there's the water, and they have this air mass inside of them. And so that wave essentially blows up their, their um, pops their airbag, basically, pop, pops their um, spaces inside their body. And so they die, and they float up to the surface. So it's very easy to fish, but it destroys not just your target fish, all the bycatch, all the other stuff, and the squid, and the crabs, and the coral heads and everything. And to say nothing else, that's actually really dangerous. So that guy right there lost his hand because a bomb went off early one time. Uh, there's all kinds of other bad stuff that goes on. Cyanide fishing, all this other stuff. So in the late 90s, these guys <coughs> excuse me, create this fisheries code <coughs> excuse me, that says they have to set aside 15% of their municipal waters in some form of marine protected area. <clears throat> and, um, and, and they go through this whole thing of, of getting agreements with international bodies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, it's all good. Main problem here with most of our MPAs around the world, but particularly so in areas with high poverty and, and low governmental efficacy and low, low, a lot of corruption, that kind of stuff, is enforcement. Enforcement is a key problem we've not really talked about yet, but it's a key part of marine protected areas. <clears throat> so we'll talk about the Sumalon <clears throat> Island marine protected area. This was, this was started in 1974. It was, it was pulled back and deleted twice um, because people, because people they couldn't enforce it and people didn't want it and all this and that. And so, um, nevertheless, when, they, when it was in effect, they did seem to have increased biomass, increased fish, increased abundance, and increased spillover into areas outside of that zone. Okay, um, we're running tight on time. So I think I'm gonna to talk to you guys about Great Barrier Reef, and then we'll finish, have to finish the ref up on Monday. Okay, so let's talk about the Great Barrier Reef, which has gotten a lot of attention the last uh, half year or so about the massive bleaching event that's going on there now. Um, but I wanna talk about the protected area network they have there. So let's talk about Northeastern <clears throat> Australia. And so I'm zooming in here. So you can see it's this, again, like the Philippines, lots and lots of small islands, lots and lots of structure there, lots and lots of nooks and crannies for all different kinds of great, cool critters. Um, the Great Barrier Reef was, I mean, it still is, but I have, I, it's, it's quite clear to me that when you guys get older, when my son gets older, this might not be the case anymore. The Great Barrier Reef is under massive stress. The government of Australia does not want you to know this because they want tourists to keep coming. It's a massive tourism engine for their country. But the, the sad reality is with climate change and all the stuff that's going on, the Great Barrier Reef is suffering tremendously. But as of right now, though, it still remains the Earth's, Earth's largest biogenic life-created structure. You can see this from space. It's crazy, right? A bunch of little teeny small, small polyps can be seen from space. Super cool, awesome. More than 3,000 reefs, sub-reefs comprise the aggregate Great Barrier Reef which is again on the, on the north, northern, which is on this side of Australia. Um, uh, spanning, you know, small, massive reefs, a small, a whole range of stuff, massive diversity. 
Caves are areas where the sand is built up so much that it's actually become a terrestrial island, a sand island. Um, and then all kinds of actual uh, terrestrial and origin islands. Very high biodiversity. They have more than 4,000 mollusk species. That's crazy. 400 coral species. More than 1,500 fish species. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. It's super awesome. Again, it's a major part of Australian cultural identity and their economic goings on. Um, I don't have the most recent data, but in the, in the early, mid 90s, we're talking on the order of 2 million people a year visiting. That's huge, right? Um, something like in 2002, something on the order of $5.1 billion. Let me say this again, $5.1 billion was generated from tourism, the overall total Australian economy was $5.8 billion, um, uh, dollars, right? So a huge fraction of the economy of this country is tied into people coming and visiting. Now, this is not just the Great Barrier Reef. This is, this is, um, this is you know, Ayers Rock and all kinds of stuff, but, but it's, it, it's really important. Um, so they passed, in 1903, they passed the um, National Parks Act and, um, and sub, sub, some subsections of that park act specifically included the Great Barrier Reef. So they were very forward thinking in that, way, way earlier than we were. Um, they formally enact the Great Barrier Marine Park in 1975. And it was the world's first, what we now call, some people call these large scale or LS MPAs, uh, large scale marine protected areas that are on the order of, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles by thousands of miles, right? So fundamentally different than that little one I showed you around Catalina. Um, the first one, and they originally wanted this to go in because they wanted to make sure they wouldn't have any oil spills there oil spills, which, you could, which could then hurt the reef, kill the reef, harm tourism. And so petroleum extraction was the main motivator for the creation of it, not so much fisheries reduction or other anchoring restrictions or something. By 1981, it becomes a World Heritage Site, slightly larger. This is where we are now. So don't worry about, don't write all these down, but just have a look at this. So what they've done is they've created zoning, just like we have zoning on land, They've taken the exact same approach and applied it in the water. So we have certain activities permitted in certain areas. So they have a whole classification scheme of, you know, here you can do shipping, here you can do anchoring, here you can't, etc. And this is what it looks like. So here's, here's one subsection of uh, a chunk of land, and which in the different colors refer to different activities that are permitted. So it's a huge patchwork of stuff, right? Some of it allows snorkeling, some of it doesn't. Some of it allows fishing, some of it doesn't. Some of it allows fish, uh, uh, ships to traverse. Some areas do not allow that. And so this is an attempt to try to make it more understandable to people and break it down. But this notion of taking literal zoning that we're used to on land and put it underwater is a huge undertaking. The concept is easy. But doing it in practice is really, really hard. We're going to hear about this when we talk about our California story. But, you know, it sounds great. That sounds great. It sounds, oh, let's do that. But where you actually allow the ships to go, where you allow the anchoring to be prohibited, that's going to probably tick somebody off that's been anchoring there or driving their ship through there for a long time. So balancing and trade-offs, a key part of this decision, a key part of this process getting the basic biological understanding, getting the socioeconomic data, and then making the hard call as to which area is an A, which area is a B, which area is a C. And, uh, and they've done that in Australia. Important to say though, as with all of our management stuff, that we're not managing the coral, we're not managing the fish, we're managing us, we're managing the people. And so in this case, right, marine protected area, not supposed to be, not supposed to have shipping and all this stuff going on. This, this coal tanker screws up, they have a, a mechanical failure and they ran aground on this supposedly pristine area full of coal, right? So not particularly good. 
So as much as we try to protect these areas and say that they're zoned for, for activity A or activity B, there's always the risk that, that accidental or intentional human actions will screw all that work up, right? So if we've spent all this time and finally gotten certain people to buy in that, okay, well, we won't, tr we won't travel here and we'll let this be the tourist place, right? And the tourism operators, okay, great, we'll have this, awesome, you guys can have that spot. Then when something like this happens, that's, that sucks, right? Because now these guys have lost, at least for this particular reef, they've lost the tourism value for some time to come, right? Let alone all the fish production and everything else. We're gonna pause there and we'll pick up, we'll finish up talking about our marine protected area network and our California story next time when we wrap up our marine protected area stuff, okay?